Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Thursday of the sixth week of Easter. Uh, in addition to Thursday of the sixth week of Easter, it is also the ascension of our Lord. This is a feast in which we remember the day that Christ actually ascended to be with the Father, the end of his time with us on earth, and that always follows falls on the Thursday of the sixth week of Easter. So, um, although this is the formal end to the Easter season, we will still celebrate that this coming Sunday, and then we'll move into a different time in our church year. So, because it is a special feast day today, it changes our readings a little bit. Um, our psalm for today is, oh, we're still going to continue with Psalm 147, and today we have the second half. But for the Old Testament, we're going to have a reading from Daniel chapter 7. Um, we're going to take a break from Ephesians and uh, read a passage out of Hebrews chapter 2. And um, although we typically don't read the gospel on uh, weekdays, uh, if you want to read, read um, Matthew chapter 28, uh, the last five verses, which talks about Christ's ascension. So, Okay, before we get into the liturgy for Matins, let's have a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own, in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Psalm 147. Worship the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He has established peace on your borders. He satisfies you with the finest wheat. He sends out his command to the earth, and his word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool, he scatters hoarfrost like ashes. He scatters his hail like breadcrumbs. Who can stand against his cold? He sends forth his word and melts them. He blows with his wind and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not done so to any other nation. To them he has not revealed his judgments. Hallelujah. Let us pray. God, our Father, great builder of the heavenly Jerusalem, you know the number of the stars and call each of them by name. Heal hearts that are broken, gather those who have been scattered, and enrich us all from the plenitude of your eternal wisdom, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. First reading, Daniel, chapter 7. We'll read verses 9 through 14. The prophet writes, As I looked, thrones were placed, 
and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> now, it's really hard to just take a small section of Daniel, <laughs> take it out of context, and um, explain it and understand it. So um, it's probably worth going back and reading maybe the beginning of chapter 7, or at least, um, yeah, beginning of chapter 7 would be good. Um, maybe chapter 6 would give you some of the history, because... Um, it's the conversation be, between the king and uh, the king of Babylon and Daniel about about a vision. But anyway, so ancient of days, the ancient of days. This is always God the Father. Um, I think this is a, a phrase that is fairly, I think, I think exclusive to Daniel. Um, there's a reference there to Psalm 90 verse 2. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think it's used any anywhere outside of outside of Daniel, but it is a reference to God the Father. Okay, now of course, um, the ancient Israelites didn't have a Trinitarian understanding of God, so they just thought this as God. Of course, you can tell by the capitalized letters. Hebrew doesn't have capitals and small letters, but. You can tell here the translators know that that's who it is because this is a name and it is it is one of the names of the God of Abraham. So um, so thrones are thrones are put in place and the ancient of days took his seat. He is clearly the one who has authority over all. This is a court scene and these are judgment thrones. Um, so his clothing white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. Um, the whiteness and the wool symbolize God's eternity and his holiness, his eternity and his holiness. The fiery flames of the throne, the wheels and the stream, they were all fiery, just like God's appearance on Mount Sinai. So this is typical of, of an appearance of, of our creator, of the God of the universe, um, encapsulated in fire i guess i'm not sure i think you know the burning bush the pillar of fire right um fire is a common um uh element in the appearance of god the fancy word there is theophany uh, a god appearance um so so we have the fiery flames the fire the throne of fire wheels of fire um a stream of fire come out from before him. Now we have these multitudes. A thousand thousands, that's a million. 10,000 times 10,000. Is that a hundred million? Okay. These are typically, usually when when a, you see a biblical reference to a thousand, it typically means too many to count, right? So what they're what they're talking about here is this is just, just a, an absolute unbelievable number. And this is a hundred times that, 
right? It's more than we could ever possibly count. And it's just an, an unimaginable number. Um, there's a lot of commentary here. Um, so, but saying that they served him and they stood him, these are actually, my study Bible here says that these are angels, right? Serving him and standing before him, myriads of angels. Okay. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Okay. Hmm. Court scene. The sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Um, this boasts against boasts against the most high, right? Which we would find in verse 25, way down here. Okay. He shall speak words against the most high. He shall wear out the saints they sh and shall think to change the times and the law, right? Who is that? Yeah. The most high, of course, being God the Father. This is the fourth beast, right? So, so this is who is being placed at judgment. So the horn was from the beast was from one of the beasts. The beast was killed and its body destroyed. Judgment. That's the judgment. Okay. Um this is uh so. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion taken away, their lives prolonged for a season and a time, right? So this beast has faced judgment, body destroyed and burned, right? Complete destruction. Um, yeah. So these beasts think they have power, but they are nothing, nothing to God the Father, right? So... The Ancient of Days here has presided over a court of judgment, and he condemns this. This is the fourth beast. There were four, four in total. This is the fourth one. He condemns it to be burned. And this judgment scene, which is repeated then in verse 26, is a prelude to the final judgment when all people will appear before the throne of God. We're told about that in Matthew 25. For those who are in Christ, the verdict will be not guilty. Because we are covered by the righteousness of the Son. Now, with that in mind, in Daniel's vision, he now sees the Son of Man. Okay? Notice the capital letters there. The Son of Man. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. Now, if you remember Matthew 26, 64. All right. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Today is the day of ascension. How does Jesus ascend to be with the Father? He is taken up into the clouds. And the angel tells them, why are you looking for him? He will return in the same way you saw him go, coming in the clouds. Okay. Scripture is consistent. The word of God is consistent. Okay. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. All right. Now, let's back up a second. We've just been talking about the beasts. The Son of Man comes from the clouds. The beasts came from the sea. Okay. The Son of Man came from above. The beasts came from below. Daniel uses comparison as he did with the first three beasts earlier in the vision. He says, like a Son of Man, basically appearing as a regular human being. Who do we know that is divine, but appears as a human? That would be Christ, right? It's one of the ways that he refers to himself, the Son of Man. Um, there is something special about this figure. This vision describes the commissioning of the Christ as our Lord and Savior. And he is introduced at the court of the Ancient of Days. So presented before him. The, the Father is still the Sovereign. And so the Son of Man is presented to him. And the Son of Man gives him dominion. This is authority, rule, okay? And glory and a kingdom. He has been given a kingdom and all the glory and authority that goes with it that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Hmm. Notice that note here. 
a man who had divine origins. He was sent to restore humanity to God, to reconcile humanity to God. <clears throat> so in contrast to the beasts whose dominion was taken away in verse 12, now the Ancient of Days has invested the one like a son of man with an everlasting reign, right? It shall everlasting reign, everlasting dominion. It shall not pass away. His kingdom shall not be destroyed. It will last forever. And nothing will ever conquer it, take it down, destroy it. Right? <clears throat> um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Daniel, in his vision, sees one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, who is given eternal rule over the entire earth. We recognize that this king is Jesus, fully divine and fully human, son of Ma Mary and son of the Most High, whose kingdom will never end. That is who this is. And it start, we, the God's children started to learn about who he would be here in the prophecy of Daniel. Okay. There are many other um, prophecies about Christ, but this is one that helps us to explain his ascension to power and to glory. Okay. Let's read Hebrews. All right. Today we're in chapter two. We're going to read verses five through 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subject in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and de of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of all people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. The founder of salvation. Just the title of this section sounds like it has it's addressing the messiah right it was not to angels that god subjected the world to come of which we are speaking right angels oversee the nations of the world if you read daniel chapter 10 but the son has authority over the whole of creation and time and that includes the angels right he has authority over them also. He didn't, he didn't put an angel in charge of the world. He put his son in charge of the world. Now, I like this. It has been testified somewhere. Somewhere? Yeah, David said it. 
right? Probably a Psalm. Yeah, Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Lowercase, right? Humanity. But this son of man, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. That's Christ. You've crowned him with glory and honor. Got a translation out there. And set him over the works of your hands, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Okay, so this talks of the kingship of the Messiah. Okay. Now, put in putting everything in subject in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. And that is referring to the completeness of everything that is subject to Christ's dominion, Christ's kingdom. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Interesting. What could we be referring to there? Well, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. I'm thinking there's more to it than that. Let's just double check. Um, so by faith alone, we confess Jesus' authority over our own lives and his authority over all things, even though life may seem out of control. Yeah, and I think there's other things that we don't know or see yet that he is also king over. Uh, let's see. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Right? We see him crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. We don't think of death as something worthy of glory and honor, usually. Certainly not in the way that Jesus died. That was not a glorious or an honorable death. That was a humiliating death. But through Jesus' death and resurrection, his true status as God's son was revealed to the sinful world, and God the Father exalted him. Right? He died the death of a criminal, and he emerged from the tomb victorious over sin, death, and the grave. That is his victory, and that is his glory. Um, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Right? Jesus' death drained the cup of sin and death that poisoned every person. We will, instead of being dead eternally in our sin, we will live life eternally with Christ because of what he did, and that because of God's grace, not because we earned it or deserved it, just because he loves us and gave us salvation gracefully. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, right? John 1 very beginning beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he talks about how all of creation was made through him and for him for him it was made for him this is his kingdom in bringing many sons to glory all right um jesus glory will be shared with all whom god leads in faith so these will be the saints right that he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting that he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Founder of their salvation is another way of saying Messiah. Uh, as God's eternal son, he demonstrated complete obedience to the father through his suffering. Just as a test may show that a student has perfect or complete knowledge of a topic, the cross showed that Jesus completely and perfectly obeyed the Father's will. Jesus' passion led to his exaltation and glory following the resurrection, culminating in the ascension. Right? For he, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Right? Now, because the Father adopts us through Jesus, Jesus and Christians all have God as their Father. 
Also, Jesus, as a true human being, shares descent with us from the one human father, Adam. He took on flesh. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, and I will sing your praise. Let's see where this comes from. That is Psalm 22, verse 22. That's the same psalm that he quotes from on the cross when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's verse one. And again, I will put my trust in him. Psalm 18, Isaiah 8, Isaiah 12. Wow. Talking about the father, right? This is, okay, so that's Isaiah. But this is quoting the son. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Yeah, this should be, this is another Isaiah quote. Yeah, Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8. But this is the Messiah figure, okay? Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, right? Children in one family are have the same blood line, is usually the phrase we use. He himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same things. He took on flesh and blood. Um. Because like children and their parents share genetic unity, Jesus became and still is a real human being, therefore truly our brother. And that taking on flesh, that word is incarnation. And through his incarnation, he shares our human nature, but without sin. Christians and their Lord share the unique fellowship of the Lord's flesh and blood through the Lord's Supper. Right? <clears throat> Oh, All right, and he did that so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death that is the devil so he had to die so that he could address that face on face to face head on so he could destroy the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery think about that does being afraid to die enslave you I think it does. I think it does. How many times in literature and in the movies have we seen someone who was made to do something they would never normally do because they were threatened with death? Either their own or someone they love and care about. Jesus' death absorbed God's judgment against sin. Right? Hmm. On the cross, Jesus bore all sin, and with it the condemnation of death. Death has a claim on those who sin until they accept the gift of forgiveness because of Christ. The devil uses God's law to bring accusations against those who have sinned. That was his job. He was the accuser. He never gave up that duty. The devil's work is to crush us under his feet. And because of our sin to dispatch us from life into death. But Christ's works are truly divine works, including to justify, to restore to life, and to save. That's Martin Luther. All who sin fear death as a consequence of sin and are bound in this fear unless God speaks his word of mercy in Christ. That's Romans 7. Right? For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, right? Remember, this is Hebrews. So he's talking to people who would think of themselves this way. We can also, we have been grafted into the, into the new Israel, God's chosen people. He chose us. We have been grafted into that in our baptism. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He had to take on flesh so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of all the people, right? The high priest performs that sacrifice to atone for the sin of the people, right? So in Hebrews, it starts by calling him the high priest. He makes equates him to the high priest 
right? He is the one, he is the, the greatest high priest for he, because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted, right? He's able to teach, but he's also given us a perfect example. Jesus removes the stain of sin bringing human beings into a relate, right relationship with the Father. We call that atonement. Jesus' prayers are those of one who has suffered and been tempted as a real human being. So he, he understands from firsthand experience what we have, have been through and are going through. We are assured that his prayers are heartfelt and effective. Okay. This is who he is. And from his throne at the right hand of the Father, he continues to pray for us, watch over us, and he will return in glory for on the clouds, just like he departed when he comes back on the day of the Lord. All right, let's conclude. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us, he promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Let us pray. Father, at your Son's ascension into heaven, you promised to send the Holy Spirit on your apostles. You filled them with heavenly wisdom. Fill us also with the gift of your Spirit. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all danger and harm. We ask you to preserve and keep us this day also from all sin and evil that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds we may serve and please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, there we go. Now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Thursday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, so we'll have matins again tomorrow, suffrage is Saturday, and um, and then our, our last Sunday of Easter on Sunday. So I hope you can join us for some or all of that. Well, again, I thank you for being here today. I wish you a blessed rest of your Thursday. Until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.